What's up everyone, welcome to the video. Today I am starting a new series all about editing your photos. In the first half of this series, we're gonna be going into Lightroom and I'm gonna show you guys five videos that's gonna start off with exposure and basic settings, then we're gonna go into local settings, then we are going to go into color in your photos, then we're gonna go into profile corrections, and compositions and then finally we're going to go into presets and other things to wrap up Lightroom before we start our other series on Photoshop. If that sounds interesting to you make sure to stay subscribed for the videos and I'll have a playlist with all the videos if you're here a little later than everyone else. So today's episode we're going to go over the histogram and the basic settings of Lightroom. This is good enough to get about 90% of your photo editing done so it's most important to learn this panel as best as you can. Okay, so let's hop into the computer right now and you guys can see that I have three photos for you guys. I have a digital raw file from my Canon EOS R. I have a film scan, which is a medium format scan from my Rolleiflex 2.8F. And then I just have a regular JPEG from my iPhone 12 mini. So to import these into Lightroom, we are going to drag over these open width. If you don't see Lightroom, don't be hesitant. We're just going to have to select that. We're going to do Lightroom Classic. And then we're going to open all of these files, select all the photos if they're not selected, and then simply import these. Once we have these three photos imported into Lightroom, we're going to go to this top, hit this drop down if it's not already available, and we're going to go to the Develop tab. This is going to open up our photos, and then we can close this tab for a little more screen real estate. On the right here is where all of our tabs are going to be, and this is where we're going to be learning throughout this course. And then on the bottom down here, you can open this up if you want to go through the photos. So we're going to close that tab down now that we scroll through those, and we're going to take a look at our photo. One of the most important concepts in photography is the histogram. This is a graph that shows you a ton of information about your photograph. The x-axis of the histogram is the exposure value of your pixels, and the y-axis is the amount of pixels that are at that value. So if you see more pictures on the left, it means your photo is darker. If you see more pixels on the right, it means your photo is brighter because that means there's more pixels that are exposed brighter. Additionally, the pixels that are on the graph also have a color value. So if there are a ton of color in one of the sections of your histogram, it means that that color is very present in that tonal range of your photo. Now we can take a live look at this. So up here we have our histogram, which we can see is broken up into those five parts. This is the black section. This is the shadow section. This is the exposure or the midtone section. This is the highlight section and this is the white section. Your histogram is your exposure value made up from the settings that you use to take your photo. Here you can see the values of ISO, focal length, aperture, and shutter speed. So if we take a look at this exposure, we can see that this is a very clean looking exposure. It might be a little more on the underexposed side because you can see this big group of pixels is over on the left side, whereas there's not as much on the right side. This is good for digital photography because if we blow out our whites, we can't recover that detail when we're shooting. An example of this is if we raise our exposure a lot and pull all those pixels to the right side of the histogram, you can see that now there's a lot of white area with no detail. You can also view this area with no detail by highlighting over this little triangle and it's going to show you all the areas that have the absolute white value, which means there is no data here except the white pixel. The more that you pull this over, the more those pixels will shift to the right into the highlights and white range. So now we can see all that is over there and if we check our clip-in with the whites, we can see that a lot of our photos detail is lost. We very much want to avoid trying to highlight clip at all. If it's not avoidable, it's fine, but at the very best, we want to avoid this as much as we possibly can. Resetting this photo back to its neutral state, we can see that we can also do that to the left side. If we want to shift the pixels to the left, we can drag our exposure down. This is pulling our pixels into the black and the shadows range, and slowly it is clipping our blacks. So if we highlight over our clipped black section, we can see that we have lost detail in those sections. And it goes without saying that these things can happen at the same time. If you pull your highlights all the way to one side and your shadows all the way to one side and you increase your contrast, you can see that I'm slowly pulling these pixels to their respective sides. We can drop the blacks more and up the whites more to really pull those pixels apart. And then if we highlight over these clipped parts, we can see we have clipped whites and we also have clipped blacks. 
if we want to be wary while we're editing, we can actually click these and they'll stay on while we're editing so we know that we're clipping our whites in the red and our blacks in the blue. I usually don't leave these on, but I check them at the end. So a little recap of what we just learned. This is where we can check our clipped blacks. This is where we can check our clipped whites. As you see in the normal exposure, none of the blacks or whites are really clipped. There is a little area right here of clipped whites, but that's completely fine. As I said, this doesn't need to be perfect. We just want to keep this minimalized and having a little bit of white point in your photo is fine as a little bit of black point. So I wouldn't even mind if there was a little bit of black there too, but you could see right there is how much I would have to pull the blacks down just to get a black point. So having a little bit of a black point and a little bit of a white point is not that big of an issue. But like I said, we want to avoid that as much as possible. The histogram is made up of these four settings that are our camera settings when we're shooting the photo. And we can see that it's broken up into the five sections, which is blacks, shadows, exposure, highlights, and whites. There is no recipe for a perfect histogram. If you have a contrasted histogram, it'll be more separated. And if you have a more flat histogram, it'll look more flat and even like this one does. All right, so that's all you need to know about the histogram. Just study the histogram on photos that you really like. If you notice that you like histograms that are shifted more to the left, then edit your photos to have a similar histogram. If you like photos that are more dreamy and they're shifted to the right, then make sure you overexpose your photos a little bit to make sure you're editing similar to the artist that you like. Usually if I have a night photo, I like to keep the histogram more on the left side. And if I have a photo during the day, I like to make it bright and airy and keep the photo in the middle or to the right a little bit. So now we're gonna finally hop into the first section of Lightroom, which is the basic panel. And yes, this is the basic panel. And that's not because this is basic, but it's because you can do 90% of your work in this panel. There are a few big things that you have to consider before you start editing your image. And it's if you want it in color or black and white. Most of my photos I leave in color. I really like the color in all my photos. And also, it's the profile in which you edit. This can severely impact your colors, your tonal range, and your histogram. So we can go through some of these and see how it impacts the histogram and the color of the image. Some people don't know about this, but this can definitely drastically change your image from its starting points. I usually like to keep this at Adobe Landscape if I'm editing a colorful image. Adobe Vivid if I want a more neutral image, or I just leave it at its standard camera standard V2, which is a profile set for my Canon EOS R, which gives it a nice clean tonal range to start. The next section in the basic tab is very important, and this is your white balance, which is abbreviated as WB. If you get this wrong in your camera and you have a raw file, it's usually not that much of an issue. You can just do auto if you want to set it correctly. Sometimes it doesn't get it perfect. Sometimes it makes the image how you want it or you can take this eyedropper tool, which is supposed to be a white balance selector, and you're supposed to select a neutral color in your image. So I would probably select somewhere in this target neutral, and then that would set my custom white balance. For this, I'm perfectly fine with how it was shot, but another thing I could do is, I know this was shot in daytime, so I can pick the daylight also, and you can see all of these are kind of similar. The daylight one seems to have a little more green in its tone, the auto seems to have a little bit more yellow in its tone. The eyedropper seems to be pretty neutral, so they'll have a little bit of yellow tones. And then the as shot seems to be the coolest of the bunch, which I think is a fine starting point. Honestly, any of these are fine starting points, as long as you're not picking the completely wrong white balance. Tungsten and fluorescent are obviously for nighttime light bulbs. So if I select one of these, I can expect that the white balance of the image is gonna be completely thrown off. So most of the time, I want to stick to those things that I know are going to be correct, which is as shot, auto, or in this case, daylight. If you are using the eyedropper tool, make sure to not pick the wrong pixel. If you pick something like this that's supposed to be blue and I select that, you can see that my image is going to be severely shifted to the magenta as this tries to make this a neutral gray. Obviously, this is blue and not neutral gray, so it is overcompensating and we don't want that. I think the eyedropper tool is very important, but you have to know how to use it and make sure you're targeting those actual neutral grays. There are definitely instances where the eyedropper tool does not work, and that's if you think a tone is neutral gray, but it's not. If you highlight something like this wall that I thought was neutral gray, but really it was a yellow wall, just slightly tinted yellow, then I could get a completely raw and white balance. Like I said, I'm going to keep this as shot, and during the coloring section, I may play around with this more to get a more colorful edit. So stick around for the coloring video so I can show you how to use temperature and tint on how to make a colorful and creative image. The next section that we have in the basic panel 
channel is the tone section. Now this is important because this directly relates to the histogram that we checked out a few minutes ago. In this section, we have exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. If I hover over these little sections and sliders, you can see that highlights the histogram to where the area it is going to affect. As you see, the shadow section on the histogram is getting highlighted here, and I can either pull those shadows to the right, or I can pull them to the left. And that drastically affects what the histogram looks like. Also, instead of selecting the shadows from this panel down here, I could select them up here and pull them to the right on this side or pull them to the left here. Exposure affects those midtones, but it's also going to pull your shadows and your highlights severely. This is something you want to do if you completely underexposed or overexposed an image. As you can see, I can pull absolutely everything to the right, or I can pull absolutely everything to the left. Contrast is something I really don't like to touch that much because it's something that can severely ruin an image if you don't know how to use it correctly. Ideally, I like to use the highlight shadows, whites, and blacks to make sure that I can add contrast this way. I'm much more likely to pull these to the right or left than to pull contrast. As you can see, if we pull contrast to the right, our shadows and highlights are really starting to pull to the left and right respectfully, and it starts to ruin the image, and the image starts to fall apart and look kind of unreal. In the other way, if we pull contrast to the left, we can see that it pulls everything in the image to the middle. It's going to start stacking all of those pixels in the middle of the histogram. And then you can see the image starts to look like a washed out gray because that's where all the pixel values are going to. I actually kind of like the way that the contrast looks if you pull it to the left, but obviously it has to be done subtly and in the right moment for the right picture. I'm going to switch up the photo for the highlight shadows, whites, and blacks because I think it makes a little more sense on this image that has a clear sky and a a clear foreground that are clearly different tonal ranges. If we take a look at our histogram, we can see that all of our bright pixels and our highlights are mostly that sky, and they're all this blue valued pixel. If we look at our midtones, we see our house, which is yellow, and you can even see that sign, which is showing up red right here on that darker side of that midtone value. So as we can see, the sky is mostly our highlight values. So as we play with this highlight slider, we could either make the sky darker or the sky brighter. Now, not all of the pixels are the sky, just most of them. You can see that there are some highlighted pixels over here, and those are also getting brighter and darker respectfully as we turn. Next, we're going to go to the shadow section, and we see that this image is actually pretty bright. There's not too much in the shadows, and they're all around the same neutral color. The shadows are probably in this area of the photo, so we can see those values change as we lift these shadows up and bring those shadows down. And then we're switching over to our final photo to go over the whites and blacks. We can see that this is a high-contrasted image. We have our subject, which is in this mid-tone section of our thing, and then we have our dark points of the photo, which is all these black points. We can see that it is clipped a little bit, and we can see we also have these white values here. So if we go ahead and mess with those white values, we can see that we can make those whites really bright and even add a little more whites to those or we can take those away and dole out those lights a little bit. Same thing with the blacks. We can really pull the blacks down here and crush all of that detail in the photo, or we can be smarter and we can lift the blacks a little bit to show the information that we were hiding inside of this car. As you can see, even though we pull those blacks to the right as much as we could, just because the image was shot in a certain way, we can't recover some of that black detail. We'd have to go to the exposure to pull that up a little more to try to recover that, and probably the shadows to recover that shadow detail a little more. And even then, we're still left with some black detail. So getting it right in camera means a lot because otherwise we can't fix everything in post. So next up in the basic tab, we have the presence section. This contains five special effects, which we have texture, clarity, dehaze, vibrance, and saturation. The first two things I want to talk about in the presence section is the texture and clarity. Now these two sliders have to do with softening and sharpening the image. Texture is like a smart soften or a smart sharpen, whereas clarity is like a general soften or a general sharpen. If we pull texture all the way to the left, we can see that it softens most of the image, but it's smart enough to leave some areas like the sign and the license plate sharp. If we pull this all the way to the right, 
we can see that it also does the same thing. It sharpens most of the image, but stuff like the sign and the license plate that were already sharp are not over sharpened. Clarity is a little more of a general sharpen and soften. So if we pull this all the way to the left, we can see that it adds a very soft and bloomy effect to the photos. This is how you get those dreamy like photos. And if you pull it all the way to the right, you can see that it kind of ruins the photo. It takes a lot of the saturation out. And in my opinion, I don't really like this look as much as pulling the clarity to the left. Dehaze is the only thing in this section that is kind of a standalone feature on its own and doesn't have a relationship. As you're shooting at longer focal ranges, there's more atmospheric haze and you'd want to get rid of that. So if there was too much haze in your photo, you'd want to add dehaze. This would kind of get rid of that fog-like look in your photo. If you wanted to add a foggy or dreamy effect, then you could actually pull dehaze to the left, and this adds a little more haze to the atmosphere. It kind of is good until a certain point, and then it really ruins the photo by adding way too much haze. So that's full dehaze added. And then finally, we have our last two things in the present section, which is vibrance and saturation. Now these two things have a relationship similar to texture and clarity. Vibrance is like a smart color and feature, whereas saturation is like a dumb or more general color and feature. As we pull vibrance all the way to the left, we can see that it takes out most of the color of our image. However, we're still left with a little bit of blue and a little bit of yellow. It's kind of smart enough to know not to take all of this color away. And you can see that in the histogram, it's taken a lot of color away to neutralize the image, but it hasn't taken it all away. If we pull this all the way to the right, it kind of adds a select amount of colors. Here it adds a little bit of blue and yellow. It's pulled all the way to the right so it looks pretty bad, but this doesn't overdo images as much as saturation does. Now going to saturation, since it's a general edit, if we pull saturation down to zero, it takes absolutely all of the color away. It doesn't do any smart calculations or anything, so if you look at our histogram, it is void of any color. If we pull this all the way to the right, it's going to boost the color value of every pixel, and it's going to make this image very punchy and saturated, and then we're not going to have any decision on which colors get increased or decreased. So I really don't like saturation because it increases all the pixels equally, and it's not usually what you want in a photo. You want to increase certain colors or decrease certain colors, which we'll get to more in the coloring section. So that's it for the basic panel. I'm gonna do a little general overview of what we just went over, and then we're gonna do three basic edits on the photos with no special coloring or anything. If we wanna get creative with these photos, then stay tuned in this series for more coloring and general effects. But for now, we're just gonna do our basic edits. So first off, we went over the treatment, which is color or black and white. Most of the time you'll leave this in whatever you desire to shoot. I left this in color. Profile, you can pick whichever one best suits your needs. I usually leave this in a standard profile set for my camera. Next up we have white balance, which I like to leave as shot, but it's also okay to leave this in auto or it's okay to select this with the tool on a neutral gray color. And if you know exactly the type of setting that you shot in, then you can also select that to flash fluorescent tungsten, shade, cloudy, daylight, or a custom if you know exactly what it was if you were in a studio. Next up we have the tone section which has exposure which is the general brightness of the image. We have contrast which kind of pulls the blacks and the whites to the right or pulls them both to the middle. Then we have highlights which lets you pull your highlights to the left or your highlights to the right. Then we have shadows which lets pull your shadows to the left or your shadows to the right. And we have our whites, which lets you decrease the whites or increase the amount of whites. And then we have our black section, which lets you increase the amount of blacks by pulling to the left or decrease in that value by pulling to the right. And then we have a little more specialized tools that we just went over, which is texture, which is a little edge sharpening or softening. We have clarity, which is general sharpening or general softening. We have dehaze, which either decreases atmospheric haze or increases atmospheric haze. We have vibrance, which adds smart color to the image or takes smart color away. Or we have saturation, which adds general color to the image or takes general color away. The only thing I really didn't go over is this auto button in this tone section, which will try to kind of adjust the image for you. And honestly, it does a pretty good job. But for me as a creative person, I don't think it is a good idea to click the auto button because it really locks you into a certain place. But if you're in a pinch and you need a good edited photo, then hitting the auto button is nine out of 10 times gonna give you a pretty good image. 
So my creative breakdown when I'm looking at this image is I want this image to kind of be a dreamy, almost pastel color-like image, and I want it to be a little more bright. And we were able to tell before by looking at our histogram that it's mostly dark by looking at this left side that has more pixel values. So I'm gonna go ahead and increase the exposure to kind of pull it a little more to the right. I'm gonna skip over contrast because like I said, I'm not a big fan of contrast. I can take it away or add it at the end, but I don't wanna mess with it right now. The thing I do notice from my image after getting a little bit brighter is that the highlights are very close to being blown out. So I'm gonna pull these down quite a significant amount just to get them to a good spot. I'm not afraid to go to 100 on any of these sliders. Some people don't think you should. I think if it's for your creative edit, it's perfectly fine, but I might pull down the exposure a little bit just to make sure those highlights don't clip. Now, the other thing with my shadows is I kind of want to see a little bit of wheel detail, and we can do this with local adjustments, which will be in our next section, but I'm just going to do a general shadow edit, and I'm just going to pull up those shadows until I can see that wheel detail. Now it's good. We can see the side of the car, some of the emblems and the handles and stuff. And now I kind of just want to add contrast using my black and white slider. Now you can see we're missing a little bit of blacks in this range here, so I'm kind of just going to pull these blacks down until we touch that point and really get like a deep dark black in our photo that's going to kind of neutralize our exposure. And then I am going to pull the whites up a little bit just until I think they look good, and I think that looks kind of good right there. Now for me, I said I did want a dreamy look going into this photo, and for me, the way to achieve that is to pull the clarity down a little bit, which is going to add that bloom effect that we talked about. And I'm also going to add a little bit of haze to the atmosphere, kind of give it a little touch. I think I might have overdone it with the clarity a little bit, so I am going to pull that up a little bit, add a little more sharpen into that photo. And then what I like to do, even if I do think clarity is a little too much, is I like to add texture because since the clarity softened the image, I like to add that edge sharpening that texture does. So sometimes if you pull these in the opposite directions, it could give you that effect that you want. So I'm sharpening the photo, but I'm also getting that dreamy effect of the photo, which is really nice. Now, I really don't think this image needs much more, but I might add a little tad of vibrance, not much at all. And I might decrease the contrast a little bit just to get a little more neutral image. That's how I would edit this first photo. The second image is gonna be a little harder for us to edit because this is a JPEG image from a phone. So there's not a lot of megapixels. There's not a lot we can do with the white balance. And we also have clipped black points and clipped white points. Now I'm going to do my best to try to hide these things by playing with these exposure values. Like I said before, if you want to do auto to see like what you could possibly get out of this image, you could see this definitely pulled the shadows up a lot and kind of made this image a little brighter. I'm not sure if that's the direction I want to go, but if I need inspiration on how to edit, I can click that and check. I'm actually kind of happy with this exposure of this image, so I think I'm going to skip over that and really play with these highlights and shadows for the beginning. These highlights, they're definitely a little distracting. I might consider a crop to just get them completely out of the photo, but I'm um, just for now going to pull down these highlights a little bit. And for shadows, obviously, I'm going to crank these up a lot because I do want to see that car. I would say right about there is good because I don't want to add too much noise to the image by pulling up the shadows. None of these sliders get away without adding some negative effects. If you pull those shadows up too much, you could get some noise. If you crank clarity up, you might get fringe in. It's just something to take note on. It's not something I'm going to go over too much in this. But just know when you do pull your sliders, the further you pull them, the greater the chance of having a negative side effect to your photo happens. Next up, we are going to pull our whites down because I think those are too bright. That's kind of bringing a little more detail back to these trees and kind of making this area a little less distracting. And I'm going to play with the blacks a little bit just to get to a decent point. The next thing I can think of is I really like the detail that we have in this window with these raindrops. And I think I'm just going to crank up texture a little bit to kind of accentuate those raindrop details. And I might even bring clarity up a tad bit just to accentuate those details and kind of sharpen this. If I don't like it, I could pull that clarity back down like the other image, but I think that's fine for now. And then dehaze, I might add a little bit of haze because this is a foggy night and I want to add a little bit to that mood. So that brightened our image up a little bit too much for me, and I'm just going to go up here and pull the exposure down a tiny bit. So now we have a little bit more haze. It's a little less contrasted, which is fine. So I'm actually going to finally add a little bit of contrast at the end to kind of get back that crunch. Now I'm really seeing a lot of color in this image, and I'm really liking it. I got the red here. I got these little green tones here. And if we take a look at the before and after, this is what we started with, which is a perfectly fine image. 
But for coloring and general edits, I want to be at a better starting point, and I think this is a nice point, at least for me. I think one thing you'll notice about how I edit my work is that I kind of make my images a little more neutral and less contrast, and this is definitely not the right way. If you want your starting point to have a ton of contrast, totally go for it, add contrast, but as long as you know exactly what you're doing and what the certain consequences you could get if you do make that point, that's what you really want to know. And I find starting with a neutral palette like this with a lot of range and the tones really lets me color better, whereas if I add a lot of contrast at the beginning, then when I go to play with my colors, the image starts to break down a little faster. All right, everyone, so that concludes part one of our photo series. This was the basic editing section and the histogram overview of Lightroom. This is extremely important. This is really where 90% of your edit is going to go down, and everything from here on out is just adding that little creative touch, which is super important, but it's not as much to master as this tab is. This tab is really the bread and butter of Lightroom and knowing that histogram and how all of these settings work is super important to edit in a photo. The next sections coming up are coloring and local adjustments. I really live and breathe by local adjustments. I do not like general edits as much as I did before as soon as I got really used to working with the brush, so that's an important section to learn. And coloring in general is what separates your photos from being little snapshots to being pure works of art that really take your visions to life. All right, everyone, I hope you hop in for the next few episodes. Stay subscribed to the channel and hit the bell for notifications on when those videos come up. I'll also have a playlist on how to Lightroom and how to Photoshop and this whole edit-in masterclass. So I hope you guys are excited as much as I am for this. So thank you guys for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Peace.